Um, so, uh, first off, we have Julian Pivotto with um, automating Jenkins. Hello, good morning. So, yeah, glad you make it to the, today. So, those are the people we came with the first bus, right? So, uh, today we'll speak about Jenkins and automation. Uh, first, I will introduce myself. So, uh, I work in Belgium and basically I'm sysadmin for a company. We we do a lot of open source consultancy. And in my current projects, I have met Jenkins a lot, uh, specifically in the last six months, uh, maybe a bit longer. But basically, I've been using Jenkins for everything in the last five years. So uh, I'm a big Jenkins fan, actually. And I usually, my focus is our uh, automation, monitoring, availability, that kind of things. So I work for Inuits. We are in multiple countries in uh, Europe, and we do yeah everything related to open source actually. So if you need something, just ask us. So Jenkins, what's important about Jenkins? In two lines, Jenkins is uh, an open source product, and it's pluggable. So basically, it means that you can do anything you need with Jenkins, anything you want. You can do. Uh, yeah, I have seen people doing basically anything with Jenkins. I don't recommend you to do like crazy stuff with it. Uh, just use it for continuous integration and deployment. But you can do everything you want. Jenkins is a, a project written in Java. Uh, it started in 2005 as Hudson and then the community forked because of uh, conflict with Oracle. And now it's a brand new project called Jenkins, which is there for like six years. and. Hudson is you know, almost dead. There is still like one commit per year, but that's all. So Jenkins uh, is also a project which is moving very, very fast. Uh, so they uh, they have now a lot of competition. Like five years ago, it was not the case in, in the open source world and that kind of things. Now you have Travis CI, which is used by a lot of projects uh, upstream. And basically, a lot of projects on GitHub, you have GitLab, which uh, provides its own, its own CI. Uh, you have a lot of CI uh, projects nowadays. So basically, they are moving fast, so uh, thanks to the competition, basically. And also, uh, Jenkins is also evolving, where basically, before, there was mostly a Java world thing. They had like native uh, uh, Maven integration, that kind of things. Like you, you could see all the jobs, all the Maven uh, jobs, and that kind of thing. Now it's almost gone in the new uh, next generation. Jenkins Maven is just one tool uh, in the in the ocean of tools that Jenkins supports. So there is no that much uh, Maven specific things in Jenkins. So really, uh, everyone is using it for a lot of different purposes, a lot of different code bases. So yeah, get. What can you do with Jenkins? You can test, build, and deploy uh, your software. So if you deliver a software like uh, packages, that kind of things, Jenkins can help you with that. If you have a service to maintain, uh, Jenkins can help you to maintain that service to build it, to deploy it. And the same with no infrastructure as code. So basically, if you have a puppet pipeline, if you have uh, Terraform, if you have Ansible, you can just do that also with Jenkins if you want. So basically, Jenkins is now uh, everywhere, everywhere where you have code. You can have a Jenkins to check your code, to deploy your code, and everything that's related to that. So it means that uh, in nowadays environments, Jenkins is basically mission critical. So you need to know uh, what your Jenkins is doing. You need to have your Jenkins up, because when Jenkins is down, People basically get no feedback on one, what they are coding, or they, they cannot deploy to production. They cannot. So basically, you need to control your Jenkins. You need to know what's in there and that kind of things. When you don't have Jenkins, then you have how, where, who, when, what's happening. You don't have any view of your infrastructure. Uh, you still have the monitoring, of course, but there you can. When you cannot deploy something, uh, then you are basically blocking everyone. If you cannot up update that uh, OpenSSL version of your production cluster, yeah, you are in not in a good state. If you cannot deploy your latest code with a bug fix that your customer runs, yeah, you it's not great uh, anymore. So Jenkins is really important. It's the place where, where everyone will look. Uh, it's a single point when you can just not say, oh, it works on my machine. No, it should work on Jenkins. And Jenkins will tell you if actually your bug fix works or not. 
so we are there to speak about uh, automating Jenkins. Uh, why do you need to automate your Jenkins? Because yeah, lots of people just don't do that. Well, what's important is that everything that you do in Jenkins should be transparent. So it means that you need to be able to audit what's going on. You need to know what's going on. Uh, if you have a Jenkins and no automation or nothing like that, then you need to go to the settings each time you want to know, oh, is that thing working? Then you need to make the build process improvable. So if, if you change something in the UI, how do you revert that? How do you change that? Uh, how do you uh, make something that your peer can code review? Like, I want to make that upgrade on Jenkins. OK, yeah, do it. No, don't do it. Just show me what you will do. Then I will tell you my ideas, and we can merge that together. Uh, then you want to have a reproducible build. It means that if your Jenkins is dying and you need to be able to have another Jenkins right away to like know that what you will do in the new Jenkins will be exactly the same as what you do, uh, what you did in the old one, and that your, the build is the same. And that complete process should be like it should be just like you know that each time you build something, it's the same thing that's built, and that no one will like change something in the middle or no one will uh, change something while the build is running. That kind of things. And also Jenkins, you need to uh, be able to upgrade it because. Traditionally, Jenkins has access to a lot of environments. Uh, it might have access to your pro to your production uh, setup, so yeah, security audit. There are also some bugs, like any other pro uh, other things, and also you have plugins updates. So you need to be able to update that. In a lot of places, uh, people are still blocked, far behind. We're still using Jenkins 1.x because I cannot upgrade because I have crappy plugins. A lot of people do. But yeah, it's not easy. First of all, building software is not easy because yeah, code bases, they are like 10 years old. Not everyone gets to know with a new fancy Go project. So yeah, the way that software is built today is some is always a complex process involving a lot of different technologies. Then for a long time, Jenkins has been yeah, just UI driven. Just people go click, 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 and yeah, it has been just in the in the way of doing things. The third point is that yeah, you have a lot of people, they just download Jenkins for the website and then launch it on the server. I have seen that a lot, really a lot. Just get the WAR file and yeah, I have deployed Jenkins, so it even works on my laptop, so now I can do whatever I want, right? And the last part is that there are so many plugins in Jenkins and you need them, you really need them because uh, Jenkins is actually reducing the core of Jenkins to put everything in plugins. So you need those plugins and you need to keep them up to date. And at a certain moment, some people will say, okay, I have my very own plugin, for example, for my stuff I need, or I am blocked to because I need to get all my plugins and there is like 20 updates. I cannot just update Jenkins right now because I would block everyone. So it's not easy to automate Jenkins. And the last part, which is also uh, part of why it's not easy to uh, automate Jenkins is because you have XML files everywhere. All the Jenkins configuration is XML. So uh, that makes it not easy to take just your puppet and say, okay, here is my new Jenkins configuration file. You cannot do that. You cannot uh, do to your puppet, okay, here is my new puppet job or update that puppet job. There are some workarounds when you can actually do that, but it's never easy to do that actually. So I I did that in the past, you know, I don't recommend that. But when you, we speak about automating Jenkins, what do we mean? What can you automate in Jenkins? First of all, the operating system, like the platform you, be, you run Jenkins, uh, where that work file will run. The Jenkins service itself, like how do you start the service, how do you stop it, which Java options do you pass to the Jenkins? Then you can also automate the plugins, like okay, which plugin do I install, how do I install them, which version, how do I configure those plugins? All of that is also important to automate. Then the global configuration, like okay, my Jenkins sends email to which SMTP server, yeah, you need to automate that. So last year, uh, we had a special, uh, a special 
Jenkins where we build a lot of open source things at customer and basically uh, we had a SMTP server which was configured to only send emails to the company and just drop all the other mails. And one guy, one, one day that SMTP server did not work or something like that, so someone changed that in the configuration of Jenkins. And just a lot of Puppet contributors just got a lot of emails like, you broke the build. They didn't, it's just someone who changed the SMTP server two weeks ago and no one noticed. And so yeah, that's why you want to keep that under control. And when something changes, you know that. So sorry if you get the mail, by the way, but that, that thing is important. Uh, and then all the security part can also be uh, automated, like uh, who gets access to Jenkins, which group, that kind of things can also be automated so that everyone gets a view on who can do what. Then the, fi the fifth thing you can automate is the creation of the jobs, the view, the folders, uh, all that kind of things, you should not go to the UI and create the job. Uh, yeah, I, I never liked that. Uh, it has been like that for a long time, but now we have really alternatives to do that in a way that you can view before that, which view will be created or how you can change a view in a safe way and that kind of things. And also if you want to like scale the number of jobs, scale the number of views, uh, then yeah, without automation, it's a pain because then, okay, I have a new view with a plugin that will provide me like something I can put on my screen. Uh, but yeah, I have like uh, 15 folders. Uh, that will take time, please excuse me. So automation also allows you to scale that kind of problems. Then you have the jobs definitions, like how do you build actually that thing? How do you build uh, that, that software or do you deploy it? All that things can also be automated so that if you want to have like one folder per, uh, per branch, one folder per anything you want, you can do that easily with uh, automation. You can just say, okay, no, for those 10 jobs, they will have the same configuration because they do the same. They are like all Puppet modules. So let's just do that in an automated way. So we don't need to click 10 times on the UI, create 10 jobs or clone 10 jobs. And then when you want to update one, you need to update the 10 of them. And the last thing is the operating system you build your software on. It means that uh, most of the time you won't have only a Jenkins server, but you will also have like uh, Jenkins nodes where you actually like say, okay, I need to build on an Android that project. I need to build on a Linux. I need to build on a CentOS 5, CentOS 6, CentOS 7, that kind of things you can also automate. So that when you want to, for example, update uh, the CentOS you the CentOS you are building on to the next Firefox version, you make sure that this is not breaking your build, and you make sure that you also do the upgrade because if like yeah, uh, I don't upgrade Firefox in my CentOS VM because then mm, who knows that will break my build. Yes, but that will break your users too. So you want to be confident and to be able to upgrade that part uh, of your CI setup too. So first part, automating the operating system. It's important to know that Jenkins is mission critical. So you need to uh, do the OS upgrade. You need to just monitor it, monitor the server. So for example, disk space, CPU usage, do I need to scale my Jenkins server? Do I, you, know, you need to be aware of that. I won't go further with that because that's just basic automation, but just don't let Jenkins be just like, oh, that VM with that Wi-Fi running and that will be fine, right? Because yeah, if it crashes, I will just restart it. No, you need to get metrics about that and know, am I actually using my Jenkins server? Am I under using it? Should I provision another one? I don't know. So just put Jenkins at the same level as the production servers, for example. Automating the service, yeah. Take the package, obviously, and also don't take the weekly releases of Jenkins unless you are really so much agile that you can upgrade all the time and get bugs sometimes. But Jenkins provides a long-term support version, so what they call long-term is three months. That's better than one week. Uh, and in those LTS version, they also do like two or three minor releases where you have critical bug fixes, for example, and security fixes. So when you 
set up your Jenkins server, also think about, OK, how do I take the backups? Uh, how, where do I put my Jenkins directories? How do I create the user? And thanks to you, the Jenkins packages provide that. So if you, you have a CentOS infrastructure, just install the package. It will do a lot of stuff for you. And just packages is still one of the best way to go to deploy software. So why, why wouldn't you use the packages that Jenkins provides? And I think that, yeah, it's two different repositories for the LTS and the weekly releases. So pick the LTS releases of Jenkins. Also, the LTS releases provide you like an upgrade path. If you have something you need to take care of for upgrading, it will be uh, in the change log as well. OK, so how do you automate the Jenkins service? It's up to you, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, anything you want. And the last part I will uh, talk about that at the end of the, of the talk as well. Of can you automate the Jenkins service using Docker? That's nice. The plugins, you need the plugins. I have never seen a Jenkins setup without like 20 used plugins and 100 plugins installed, but that's another story. But like, usually you have like between 20 and 50 plugins just because like you need the pipeline, then you want uh, reporting, you want Cucumber, you want a lot of things that are just in plugins. You want uh, notes, you want, yeah, just. Plugins, plugins, plugins. Even the Git, Git is a plugin, even if it's basically installed everywhere. So all of those plugins can be installed from the UI, they can be installed from the command line, they can be installed from the Puppet module, from the Chef, uh, receives, like that kind of things. And what we have tried to automate those Jenkins plugins, and what we are still doing is like we are packaging them into traditional packages which is something that's not provided upstream, so we have basically a mirror of all the Jenkins plugins. I think there are like 1,000, I don't remember exactly. Uh, but you have a lot of plugins, uh, and you can like know they have a fixed download path, so you can actually get the, a file called update.json, which should contain everything you want, and we have some scripts to do that and to just make packages out of that. You can also obviously mirror the Jenkins plugins repository. Uh, so you can just like point Jenkins to your own updates. Uh, but then the problem that you will have is that you don't need to cache uh, those plugins because uh, by default, Jenkins will just take the latest. So if you cache that one, you will get problems to do that. You also have a script, install plugins.sh in the Docker uh, in the Docker image that Jenkins provides that do the same, but using just a shell script. And they will like download the, the file, download the dependencies, and everything that's needed. So that's for the plugins. Global configuration. So the global configuration of Jenkins is that giant XML file where everything is configured. So you can just change the XML file. Yeah, don't do that. So. Two, three years ago, I did that. I did change that configuration file using a tool called OGAS. And what OGAS is doing is basically they you telling, OK, that XML path should be that value. And it becomes horribly complex. And it's yeah, it doesn't worth it to change those XML files. Uh, you can do that, but then you also need to restart Jenkins each time. So it's really annoying to do that. So don't change the XML files yourself. It's not, no, it doesn't work it. But, 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 there is a plugin system config DSL plugin which allows you to, instead of defining that giant, uh, that giant configuration file in the XML, you can just like uh, write a small DSL script that will just configure your Jenkins. The problem with that plugin is that it does not exist yet. So there is a Git repository, it's empty, there is uh, ideas, Tyra tickets, all of that is there, but just no one is working on that now. So if you have some time, some Java skills, just do this, this will be awesome. So what do we do then, given that we don't want to change XML files and that we don't want to, that that plugin does not exist yet? Yeah, groovy. So. Uh, we will hear that a, lot, a couple of times in this talk, but Groovy is like uh, a language, which is like a scripting language that runs on top of the GVM. And you can call uh, the classes that are in the class path. So basically, you can 
uh, integrate with the Jenkins APIs and do API calls using uh, that specific uh, language. And that's what actually Chef Puppet used to automate Jenkins. So when you say to Puppet, okay, update that job or put my LDAP credentials so that I need to log in with LDAP, to actually use that Groovy language to interact with Jenkins. The way you can do it very easily is like to uh, use the Jenkins script console. So if you go to your Jenkins instance, you open slash script, you have the script console, and you can basically uh, run any script you want. Like if you don't have an automated Jenkins, but you still want to like disable all the jobs, you can do that in Groovy, uh, just in the script console. So you don't need anything else. Just go to your Jenkins for each job, for each job, just disable, and it will just do it very easily. So still, that's used by a lot of people, which are just like, yeah, OK. How do I update all the job at once? I don't have any other way. I just copy and paste this in the console, and that will do it. You find that a lot. So I will show you some example of scripts that you can run in that console. Uh, you will see there are a couple of things that you can do. First of all, like, I don't want any executors on my master. OK, I just check instance that executor 0. And then you don't, uh, you cannot execute anything on your master. I want HTML descriptions instead of plain text descriptions. OK, you, you can do that also, like uh, set markup formatter and then anything you want. The system message, like the message that you have on the top of your Jenkins, yeah, set system message. Once again, it's easy. And I have HTML because I've just enabled the plugin just before. So all of that, you can do that uh, at the runtime of Jenkins. If you want like to have your logo on Jenkins because you are at really hype, you can also do that. Like I take the simple temp plugin. Uh, I will configure it like, OK, here is my custom CSS, and then save the configuration. And that will just be great. In this case, I'm also using uh, user content. Uh, it's interesting because user content is a directory in the Jenkins home. And everything you will put in that directory will be served, uh, served over HTTP by Jenkins. So in this case, I have my CSS file under the user content of Jenkins. And I can just access it via the URL. Uh, you need the read permission on Jenkins to do that, I think. So you can, uh, it's still protected if you have login on in front of your Jenkins. But that's really uh, a cool feature of Jenkins. And basically, that simple team, that sim simple team plugin uh, has not been upgraded for like four years now. But it's still working because the Jenkins API are yeah, somehow stable. So that's nice. Email, the same thing. How do I set up my email, my SMTP server? Just do it like this. It is able to use statistics, but all of that thing, you can also set up the LDAP authentication, uh, the prefix that you use in Jenkins, the slave, the clouds, global libraries, which we use for pipelines, the credential, and the first jobs. All that thing can just be uh, automating using Groovy. And if you want, if you have the pipeline utility step plugin, which you have by installing the pipeline plugin, then you can also do stuff with YAML. So they actually they include the uh, YAML library in their plugin. So you can just do like, OK, just load, tell me what's that YAML, and then you can just play with the YAML file and do everything you want. That's really, really great, because then you don't need you know, the people who use Jenkins and who update the, document, the configuration, they don't need to change those groovy files. They just need to change, to change some YAML files that you have set up, and they just say, like, a YAML file is like, OK, SMTP server or a list of jobs, that kind of thing. So you don't need to actually uh, change those Groovy files because no one actually likes that. So that allows you to separate the data and, uh, and the code itself. A lot of links. You have five minutes to note them after it's gone. So basically, you have all those links when you can find a lot of groovy stuff. You see, this is like uh, the Puppet module. This is like a uh, chef thing, I think. This is like Ansible. So all of those uh, plugins are just so sources when you can find those groovy examples. 
so if you want to know how to configure LDAP, that's a complex thing, but you have examples in those links. If you have a strange plugin, or if you want to do something that you cannot find easily, you also have the Java doc, so uh, they also publish that. Uh, that documentation automatically, so like you have it for the plugins, you have it for uh, the core, you have it for everything basically, just like to check what's the internal API of Jenkins. Uh, that's very, very useful. So if you are you, if you have Java developers, of course it's, it's easy. Uh, but I am not a Java developer, but I find my way in Groovy because I'm now used to that, and it doesn't take months to learn. And you have a lot, lot, lot of examples. So we have automated our Jenkins. That's nice. But I don't want to go to that console each time I want to change something. Or and I, the first time I launch Jenkins as well, I don't want to like do the work of copy paste. Oh, no, I don't want that. So Jenkins provides you a folder called init.groovy.d when all of those nice groovy scripts that you have seen and that I show you like will just be like run at the beginning of Jenkins. So it means that uh, when you have the Jenkins it getting ready to work message on the web, web page. It's actually doing a lot of things, and one of those things is like running all the Groovy scripts that are there. If you install Jenkins with the RPM, you have one already which disables some security thing. I don't remember exactly why. So you drop the file, you restart Jenkins, and you will have the, your update if you want. So it means that when you bootstrap a new Jenkins, so there's a lot of people who say, okay, I've been promised a Jenkins by the infrastructure team, or the infrastructure silo, sorry. And yeah, but that will not be my need, so I need, I will do my Jenkins myself, and then you say, okay, we'll have a Jenkins for that project, but then for legal reason or any reason, we'll have a second Jenkins and a third Jenkins, and so if you have multiple Jenkins, just make your Groovy files and drop them, and they will just all be configured the same way. The scripts are executed sequentially so that if you uh, name them correctly, it will uh, behave just like you expect that. Uh, and also, yeah, if you have a mistake, if you have an exception in your Groovy script, Jenkins will just not start. It will just say, ah, I can start. So you need to take that in consideration. Uh, you need to take that in consideration when you start playing with that. that you need to be sure that you under exception if you want to Jenkins to start or not. I like the default behavior, so that's fine for me. That was you can automate the global configuration of Jenkins. Now we can dig, dig deeper and go inside Jenkins. So how do you automate like the jobs, the folders, uh, everything like that? So you can do it with the GUI. Yeah. Okay. So you need a GUI can also create jobs, we'll see that later. Uh, you have a plugin called Jenkins Job Builder and Job DSL, so let's go. Jenkins Job Builder, OpenStack, Python, uh, they support templates. You can extend that, it can do, do XML directly. And it, but yeah, you see there's limited support for a lot of things, so at least six months ago, if you needed to have Jenkins pipelines, it was not that easy. Uh, so yeah, they have limited support for all the plugins that are there. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit far from the Jenkins world. It's really an open stack project. They had a problem and they solved it the open stack way by just coding something. And then, but still it allows you to put the job configuration under uh, source control. So that's still a great project, but that's not my preferred one. But if you like Python, if you like that kind of things, you can just use that. And it's completely uh, independent from Jenkins, so you don't need Jenkins to do that. You can build your XML files locally and that kind of thing. So yeah, it has its advantages. But I prefer this one, the Jenkins Job DSL plugin, uh, which is a Jenkins plugin started in like five years ago. And it's also groovy, and it allows you to create jobs, views, uh, so you also put your Jenkins job configuration under source control, so that's also a nice thing. So how does it look like? Well, that's what you can do in your init groovy.d to call that plugin. So you tell him what you need, your DSL script there, and it will just do it. So basically, 
job management transcripts and it will just do that in your init.create.d. So yeah, it's groovy once again, uh, but but that plugin is really a large community of users and they support a lot, lot, lot of plugins, but like a lot. And basically all the useful plugins, they support it. And they also have auto generation for plugins that they don't support. So creating a job, it looks like this. So I have my job. Uh, my source control is git, and then I will just run make test. That's an easy one, how to create just a basic freestyle job. Creating a, a pipeline job like this, like my job has that definition, and then you have the script uh, of the Jenkins pipeline. Then you can set the properties of the jobs, like parameters, that kind of things. You can do that with the uh, Jenkins job DSL plugin. Then you can do like loops. So if you do read a YAML file, for example, with uh, all the jobs or a, a list of uh, job configuration, then you can just do like for all the jobs in the configuration, just make me a job with that name. And then if there is SCM in my job definition, just put that there and that kind of things. So that's when you, you get the power of the job DSL is when you start using loops using uh, Groovy uh, stuff, then you have all the freedom that you want. You can also create views, like, OK, I want that column in my view, that regex, that kind of things. I want it to be recursive across all the folders that I have. Uh, for those who don't know what's a folder, it's a Jenkins plugin that allows you to, instead of having a flat Jenkins, you put stuff in different folders so that uh, you can do like uh, ACL and uh, configuration per folder, so it's quite nice. And it's yeah, if you have more than five jobs, just think about folders. Uh, working with plugins, so the plugins are supported. Actually, you have an API viewer. So on your Jenkins setup, uh, you just go to plugin job DSL API viewer, and you will see okay, what does the job DSL plugin support in the plugins I have. In this case, the build monitor view, and then I create that view, that name, and then the job that I want in that view. Uh, that's really nice, and really a lot of plugins are supported, so. Um, so you can also use the job DSL plugin uh, inside your pipeline jobs, just job DSL, then you tell him like, uh, which scripts that you want to run, like, okay, all the Groovy scripts in the C directory. And you can really, it's really easy, and then you can also say, okay, remove the jobs that I am not longer managing, or remove the views that I no longer managing. So that's also nice, and you can actually run multiple Groovy scripts. So you can just do that in a pipeline job, regular pipeline job. Uh, in previous version of the job DSL, I didn't tell you that, but you could run anything. Like all the init.groovy.descript that we have seen, they did just run fine in the job DSL configuration, which is something that yeah, they have fixed now. But if you depend on that, you can just like uncheck that box and just continue working on it. And that's how you uncheck the uncheck that box in the init.groovy.d, for example. Just and if you do that, then you can just like do everything you want. So if you want to like all the stuff that you have in the init.grevy.d, if you want to run it in a script, you can also do it. So you can update your Jenkins configuration, global configuration, without restarting your Jenkins. So that's also a nice thing, too. That's a good tip. You can also say, OK, but I want to read my YAML files or anything like that, then you can also do that, like add that to my class pad, the yaml.jar file, or any other Java library. So I guess this is more for like Java users. But if you do that, then you can do this. You can directly import the YAML library, which is in that YAML files, and it will just run fine. And then you can once again uh, use the YAML files to do your configuration. OK. That was for uh, the views and the, the jobs, but like the configuration of the jobs. Now let's dig deeper and speak about Jenkins Pipeline. So what's Jenkins Pipeline? I think I've mentioned that already a couple of times, but Jenkins Pipeline is like Jenkins jobs as code. It means that uh, the steps of your job are just 
declared in a file called the Jenkins file, which uh, you can think about that like the Travis CI.yaml, except that it's completely different, but it's the kind of thing where you just, you don't go to the UI to change the way your software is built, and if you have a big difference between two branches, then you don't need to have two different jobs, you can just do it in one job, that kind of things. So the idea is that you have a Jenkins file in your in your repository, or, and then you just make the steps in that file so you can do everything, you like a code review, that kind of thing with that file. So it used to be imperative, like really a script that you execute, and now they have, since three months, declarative pipeline, which is like a pipeline version two. It's a lot of improvement and greatness compared to the first version. So let's let's look for that. So the Jenkins file, they, there is the job definition. You don't need a GUI, but there is a GUI if you really want that. It's called Blue Ocean, and you can edit the Jenkins file from there. Uh, you can find uh, the steps, the report, the environment variable, the nodes, everything you want. And the plugins can also provide additional steps. So like if you have a Docker plugin, you can you have Docker steps if you have. So plugin integrate with that as well, so you can actually do everything you do in the plugins as code as well. And you also have a generic step for plugins that don't really support the pipeline. They can just integrate it to that step thing and just you can work with a lot of plugins then. So the Visual Pipeline editor is a kind of work in progress, uh, but if you uh, want to know, okay, what can I do with my pipeline, then you have in all the pipeline jobs a link, pipeline syntax, when you can see actually uh, the plugins that you use, or you can use them, and you can actually do like sort of a GUI thing and click a button and it will just print you the groovy thing that you need. So old pipelines, like script pipeline or the SIPO, that's like this. That's like, okay, I have an Ubuntu EMD64 node, and on that node I will like check out my Git repository, and then run make, and then run test, and I do that in three stages so that it will uh, be nice on the, on the GUI. That's the theory. Here is the practice. Okay, the practice is like, okay, I don't have any stage because I don't care, but like check out SCM is out of a stage, then I try make if that fails and I put the job as unstable and then I still like publish my error.log and I throw the error and that's not run. So in the real world, you need to take care about exceptions because you cannot say, okay, at the end of the build, send me an email. Uh, you cannot say, okay, if that's failing, then run this and that. So you really need to do like that, try, catch, or that's, uh, that's something that has changed now is like declarative pipeline, where you can just say, okay, pipeline. To, so instead of defining the node, the first thing that you define is the node or anything you want. The first thing you define is the pipeline, and you say, okay, pipeline, all the job will run on Ubuntu. Then you say, okay, here is the option for the job, like uh, kill it after four hours, print the timestamps and anti colors, anything you want. Then you need to define stages so you cannot have anything outside of those stages. It's a requirement. It means that you cannot do things like, okay, I will do the ESCM and it will not be anywhere in the GUI. No, you need to define stages and then in those stages you need to define the steps. Uh, I don't check out in the declarative pipeline, that's one of the stuff that they have changed, uh, is that uh, they do the checkout by default if you have a node, an agent, they call that an agent there. Then uh, the second thing that's very useful is that instead of doing the try, catch, send an email, that kind of things, you just have like a pipeline post, which is like, okay, when my job is failing, just do this. When my job is successful, do this, or always do this. Like In this case, even if the build is failing, it will just always publish the, uh, G -unit res uh, the G unit tests. So that's uh, really an evolution, but it gives you uh, less freedom on what you can or can't do, because you could really do anything as the pipeline. So in this case, yeah, you are a bit more limited. You need stages, you need that kind of things, but 
it's really an improvement. So declarative, we check out the code. Uh, we also get a workspace, so you don't need to like all the noting. Uh, you need to have stages, and yeah, you have like the wrappers I showed you. If you want to scale those pipelines, uh, you can define them in the job DSL, and you can also use global libraries, which is like uh, uh, a location when you will be able to like put every uh, command script that you have between all the jobs. So if you have like uh, a Jenkins repository with a Jenkins job, in the Jenkins file, or a, Jenkins, a Puppet module, for example, you don't need to put the whole configuration in that Jenkins file. You can use a shared library. And in that shared library, in the Jenkins file, you call the shared library, like build, build Puppet module. And then the intelligence will be in the shared library, so that when you update the library, you update all of the configuration of all the jobs. And you don't need like module sync and that kind of things, for those who know what this. But basically, the idea is that to scale your Jenkins or to make it easier, uh, you just define some functions in that shared library. Jenkins node, so that's where you build your job. That's the CentOS you build your uh, Java code. That's the Android you build your APK. That's anything you want. So what we do for that is Docker. We do Docker, Docker, Docker. So we run the jobs inside containers. Uh, so we have like clean short lived container so that the container run runs the job and then it's killed. So it means that it's easy to update those containers uh, and we use the Docker plugin for that. So actually we put no Docker logic inside of the pipelines. Like we don't say the pipeline start the Docker container. We just say in the pipeline run on Ubuntu and then on my configuration I say that Ubuntu is the container uh, which runs that version of Ubuntu. And we use that pattern. So basically, you have a container uh, to when we build a container, like which Ubuntu we will build that. We tag that container Ubuntu with a tag can candidate. We push that to the registry. Then we uh, run a test on that uh, candidate thing. Like, OK, let's test that my Ubuntu has access to the APT repositories. OK, it's fine. Then I run a build. like. I will, OK, I, I have my Puppet module. I want to run it on Ubuntu. I will take my new Ubuntu image. I will run a build using that image. And if that build is successful, it means that, OK, I can tag my Ubuntu image with the release tag and push it again. And release is the default that you have uh, in your configuration, for example, so that now that it's tagged with release, uh, all the next job will run with that uh, new Ubuntu image. So that's how you can easily upgrade your uh, Docker images that you built on, for example, just like by having a tag uh, on them and then uh, put a parameter on your jobs, like uh, instead of Ubuntu MD64, you have Ubuntu MD64 and then the parameter, and then you launch a job with that parameter. In practice, we automate the, Jen the Docker plugin configuration with Groovy as well, so that we have like 20 images, but we don't configure them in the GUI because the Jenkins plugin doesn't scale in the UE. Uh, so, and each time that we do that, that we upgrade a new Docker image, it's like, okay, we set that uh, both the candidate and the release tag, and it's just a slave or a node in Jenkins. So let's take a look. So you have a parameter in your jobs, and then you use it like this, like, Pipeline is my agent built into a seven and parameter dot tag, which by default is in this case release. And when you build that, you have something like this. So like Docker build, don't use a cache, tag as candidate, push to the registry, then run some tests, then build that job, and then just change the tag and say, okay, build the job with the candidate thing so that here will be like build into a seven candidate which I just pushed before that. And if that's not failing, then we continue and we just tag as release and we push that again. And it means that if there is a Firefox upgrade that breaks my build, if there is a OpenGDK upgrade uh, that breaks my build, I will notice that that job is wrong and I can fix my code to make it working. 
but I am not blocking everyone for the daily job, like because, oh, you know, the build is broken because of Firefox update, so just merge the patch to be fine. No, in this case, we just block uh, at that step, and you can just fix the problem in your code and just the build, the default build is just always green. So it also means that you can run apt updates, yum update, uh, apt upgrade, sorry, uh, in your container so that they are up to date. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, people with, you just sell a software and you say, okay, you need to use the latest CentOS, you need to use the latest for that, you need to do your updates, but I never test that with the updates. So in this case, it's easy for you to like run once or two, two times a day that upgrade of the images. So, And it's also important to know that if you build something in a Docker container, you need to build that container. You don't want to like build it on your laptop, send them to the registry, and okay, if there is an update, I will do it myself. No, you need to have a process, preferably like in Jenkins, to rebuild those images and to be able to change them in an automated way as well. So it's important to, to do that. So Docker, what about we put the Jenkins master in Docker? Like the complete Jenkins thing in a Docker container. Why would you do that? Yeah. The, what's important there is that you say Jenkins as a all in one burden, uh, all in one uh, bundle that you update all at the same time. Like you have atomic updates of your Jenkins, the Jenkins version, the Jenkins plugin, all of that updated at the same time. It is also easy to test, so you don't need an acceptance Jenkins to test your Jenkins setup. You can just like run the container on the as a Jenkins job and then see if it works or not. And it means that you will be able to upgrade it more easily. And that's important. So that you should just if upgrading Jenkins is like a button you click, which starts a new Jenkins, and you can just go to that second UI and see, okay, my Jenkins is okay, I can just do the upgrade and look you click a second button and that's done. There is a price for that. Uh, it means that you don't want to run any job on that master, like you want to put everything in nodes. Uh, you need the Docker registry, but I guess most of people have nowadays. Uh, you need to deal with Docker instabilities, like if you have never done Docker before, or if you, yeah, it's, you need to know that. And then you need to think about how you will like deploy that container, how will you do if you completely, if you want to upgrade easily, uh, don't do that on your laptop, that kind of things, just a pipeline in your Jenkins master, it needs to be done, right? So. There is a price. What does Jenkins provide upstream? They provide two images, well, four images, Alpine, Linux, Ubuntu, LTS, Weekly. So basically, what, what we used uh, is like Alpine, LTS. Uh, but if you have a full Ubuntu environment, maybe you want the Ubuntu one, or maybe you can also build your own one if you, like if you have a CentOS shop, and then you can just say, okay, I will build my image on top of CentOS, that's also possible. What does it look like in the Docker file? Here you go. So from that version of Jenkins, um, and then, uh, as root, I will go and copy my user content directory, like my CSS, that kind of things. Uh, I will make those directories. I, actually, I, I should have done the other way around. Uh, and then I will like, okay, put the log directory, the lib directory, the curse directory, all of that things, uh, you need to do them. Uh, and then if you need to change the time zone, then you say, okay, this is Alpine Linux, how do I do that? Then you have that horrible comment to change the time zone. I still hope to find customers who don't change the time zones, but okay, it doesn't happen. Uh, then you need to install the plugin so that you can do like a check-ins user and then you like copy a text file which looks like this, like a list of plugins. You can also have a colon with the version number. And in that Jenkins image, you have a script called installplugins.sh. You just use that, and it will just fetch all the plugins uh, with the versions that you want and install them. So that's also a nice thing. And then you can also copy the init.groovy.d to configure uh, your Docker images on startup. 
So, I mean, yeah, something important is that if you keep your configuration in a volume, like in a persistent way, then you need to suffix your file with that overwrite uh, in that user share Jenkins ref uh, directory so that uh, it will simply uh, override them each time. The default behavior of the Jenkins box is that the content of that directory, which is not in the volume, uh, will only be uh, moved to the Jenkins home if uh, it is not there already. So that's there is a script uh, on Jenkins startup that do that does that move to the Jenkins home for everything in that directory, and that's what you should use. But if you keep a state, then in mind about that dot override stuff. The Java options, just like uh, regular environment variables in the Docker image, uh, like the, the RAM, uh, don't run the setup preserve so that when you start Jenkins, you say, hello, do you want to click some buttons with me? No, just that option. Uh, and the reboot is also to get like the work file outside of uh, the volume that Jenkins uh, keeps be between the runs. So to test the image, we just have like a small change. It's like we pass an environment variable when we start the Docker image, and in that case, we just put Jenkins in uh, in write mode, which means that uh, it will not run any job automatically. Uh, so in that case, yeah, you 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 can go to the UI of the Jenkins you test, and if you want, you can disable that write mode. But most of the time. Uh, the C job is run, and the C job you can run one or two jobs as well, but you don't want that Jenkins in a container to run all of your tests at that point. So we also have that script that we do for the Docker in the Docker container to test it, that uh, when we boot the container with the new Jenkins that we want to test, uh, we wait it to be started, or we wait to see if the script has been failing. So we do some grep stuff to do that, and then we try to run that script like 30 times every 10 seconds until Jenkins is started. Once that's done, we know that either Jenkins has failed or Jenkins has started, and you can go further in the Jenkins deployment. Uh, and then we test, once again, the config file, and we know that, okay, there are some strange typos. Uh, so uh, if we have one of those groups in the Jenkins log, then we know that there are something wrong in the logs. And then we just return false, and that's just like, OK, you will have your Jenkins job just read. So you know, OK, something is wrong with, with my Jenkins. In the init.gui.d, we also call the C job because uh, we create the C job, which is a job DSL stuff, and we run it in the in the query D. And if the C job is not succeeding, like if there is an error or something like that, uh, we it will fail the startup of Jenkins. So I know that my Docker image with my Jenkins master is not good for production, and I can promote it. So that's what Acer do. It will just like fail if my C job is not successful. So it's great to have a pipeline to deploy Jenkins uh, and to deploy the configuration and check that the C job is working, that's great. But you can go further and like, don't keep the Jenkins configuration between each run. Like, don't put anything in the volume, just build the complete configuration each time you start Jenkins. You still want to keep the job history, so that's how you do that. You have like that raw builds directory, uh, which you put that on the volume somewhere, a persistent volume, and it means that when Jenkins will start up, it will find the history of your jobs. So uh, that still allows you to like, I trash the complete configuration, but I know that uh, the last 10 jobs were successful. If you don't do that, then yeah, it's kind of a problem for a lot of people not to have the job history, and I understand them. So, Conclusion, uh, you can automate completely your Jenkins from the operating system to the node to the job. Everything can be automated. Do it, it's important. Even when you use Jenkins a lot, you will see that 
sometimes when Jenkins is not enough, so it's important to be able to to have any freedom you can with Jenkins. I just use the following patterns like in D Jenkins job DSL pipeline, and if you can just uh, try Dockerize Jenkins, it might work for you. It did a great job for us, so we are really happy with that. So just do it, try it, tell me what you think about that, and that's all. Thank you for listening. <laughs> any questions? Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions? Come on. Come on, we have five minutes. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Just Julian. Thanks. completely your Jenkins from the operating system to the node to the job, everything can be automated. Do it, it's important. Even, even when you use Jenkins a lot, you will see that sometimes one Jenkins is not enough, so it's important to be able to, to have any freedom you can with Jenkins. I just use the following patterns like in D Jenkins job DSL pipeline, and if you can just uh, try Dockerize Jenkins, it might work for you. It did a great job for us, so we are really happy with that. So just do it, try it, tell me what you think about that, and that's all. Thank you for listening. <laughs> any questions? Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions? Come on. Come on, we have five minutes. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Just Julian. Thanks. So, we have a 15 minute coffee break and we'll continue with the next talks at 10:45.